Fight fans, welcome to the PBC Podcast, brought to you by Premier Boxing Champions with your host, Kenneth Buhari and Michael Rosenthal. Welcome, everyone, to the PBC Podcast. I'm Kenneth Buhari, and with me, as always, USA Today Boxing Junkie Editor Michael Rosenthal, and we are back for another week of boxing banter. We've got a good show for you guys. Uh, Super welterweight contender Erickson Lubin will be joining us a little later. We're going to break down the Fox PBC Fight Night card from last weekend, and we're going to look ahead to this week's show Plus, of course, our toe-to-toe segment, we're going to discuss the possibility of a super heavyweight division, another division, however you want to phrase it. we got a lot to say about that. But first, it was a hectic, hectic weekend. Uh, Lots of action and a KO of the year candidate with huge implications for the heavyweight division, as you no doubt can guess. Now, we all saw what happened uh, Dillian White was a heavy favorite against Alexander Povetkin, and with good reason. Uh, Povetkin, just a few weeks away from turning 41, uh, hadn't had a good win in a long time. White had the backing of a, a British fan base that believed he was the best fighter in the world to never fight for a world title. I think I even saw one prominent U.S. reporter regurgi- regurgitate that. Uh, but anyway, White scored two flash knockdowns. Uh, uh, the action was fairly even aside from that. But then in the fifth, Povetkin stepped in with his big left uppercut, and White was asleep, I I mean, before his body even hit the mat. No count needed, and just like that, tables turn, as Errol Spence would say. Mike, put this in perspective for us. What does Povetkin's big win mean for the heavyweight division? I would say the most significant impact is that White is out of the way for the time being. Um, I think he was sort of a thorn in the heavyweight division side because uh, the way it was set up, you know, before this happened, you know, he was going to get the winner of the uh, the third uh, Tyson Fury Deontay Wilder fight, uh, or the 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 WBC title holder was risking losing the title. Uh, now that he's out of the way, you know, the winner of that fight could go right into a, a fight against the winner of uh, Joshua and Pulev without any problems. So I think that's the biggest thing. Um, you know. He's going to get his rematch, though, and, um, you know, who knows what happens in that fight. But no matter what happens, the, you know, the White's dreams of fighting for a title have been pushed back. So that's I think that's the biggest impact. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know what, though? I, I thought White was being a, a little overly optimistic, thinking that he would be in line for that world title shot, no matter what uh, the WB said. So for some reason, I feel like the only thing that changes is perception. You know, White was perceived mainly by his uh, his fan base to be someone who could toppled Deontay Wilder. That was, you know, his his whole PR push. And I, honestly, I thought Deontay would have decapitated him. Uh, but I think the reality is that the WBC, where White was ranked number one uh, contender, they were unlikely to to hinder a unification match between a Wilder Fury three winner and Anthony uh, Joshua, provided Joshua get past Kubra yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there's just way too much money involved in that fight. And then would it really surprise you, Mike, if they elevated the winner of Wilder Fury 3 to franchise champion? Oh, man, let's not even talk about that. <laughs> uh, I, you see, because the thing is, I don't even, I'm just not clear on exactly what that means, you know. It again. means you don't have to fight a mandatory. Yeah, no, no, I guess that, I understand that part. But in terms of what it means to be the franchise champion, is is that, the, is he still the champion? Is right. Not, it's like this weird gray area. Right. I'm, I'm not sure I agree with you. I, I the, you know, the way I read it, let's put it that way. The way I read it, uh, Eddie, what it's all the stuff Eddie Hearn was saying, I think that, that I think Fury, let's assume for a second that Fury was going to win based on the last fight. I think Fury's intention was to fight uh, White uh, before he fought Joshua. I think that that's the way I read it. I can't, you know, obviously now we will never know because because he Eddie White, has a habit of speaking for oh, other people. He has um, a habit of speaking a lot. It, yeah, um, exactly. Um, yeah, no I, I don't know. I, I think if you told Fury, let's say Fury or Wilder, let's say whoever the winner was, you tell them, okay. You can go to a Josh. You can go straight to the Joshua fight, or you can fight Dillian White. I think it's a no-brainer for either one of those guys. I think some wishful thinking by uh, by Eddie Hearn there, but I mean, I don't know. I mean, you you mentioned the rematch. First things first. White's got to get the rematch out of the way. He does. He does have a rematch clause, and his team says they're going to exercise it. They're they're talking about November, which which may be too soon. But hey, look, I mean, that's their business. Do you think a, a second fight is any different? Yeah, I don't think he's going to get knocked out like that. I mean, anything's possible, right? Yeah. Um, 
I, I thought White was um, – I thought he was in control, you know, especially after the fourth round. I mean, it looked to me like, okay, now it's going to be an easy night for this guy. He's just going to win going away, whether it's a decision or a stoppage. I mean, after two knockdowns, you think maybe he's going to stop him. Um, I, I have to think he'll be maybe a little bit more careful, you know, avoid that kind of shot and, and win the fight. You never know, though. Uh, that kind of knockout can play games with your psyche. Uh, maybe I'm stating the obvious. You know, some guys aren't quite the same after getting stopped like that. Uh, and White actually said, um, maybe it was yesterday, that he would knock out Povetkin in the rematch. That's probably not the ideal way to approach a rematch. Uh, I think that he wins, but it's certainly not a given. Um, the fact that, that Povetkin won just shook everything up, though. It's just, it was, I'm not taking sides, but it was pretty cool to see that, the way things, the way things got shaken up. Yeah, it, it was, and, and and not to mention the way like it got shaken up. Emphasis yeah. on the way. I mean, that kind of knockout that it went viral. I mean, it was just oh, insane, yeah, exactly. and and it was beautiful veteran move by Povetkin too. I mean, you gotta you gotta hand it to him. Uh, the way he dipped the left the left uppercut, everything it was just picture perfect. Now I I'm in agreement with you. I mean, look, Povetkin's 41, uh, or he's about to be 41, and to me, this knockout aside, he he hadn't looked really good and in years. Uh, I thought the first three rounds actually were really competitive, and, and I might have given the edge to Povetkin, but everything changed in that fourth round, um, where White knocked him down twice, and then it sort of looked like, well, this is going to end up in a knockout win for White, and then boom, uh, we saw what happened in, in the uh, fifth round. Would I be surprised if Povetkin lost the rematch? Not at all, but again, Dillian White hasn't shown to me that he's at that level that, that sort of matched that, the hype that he had going in. Uh, you know, all of this 1,000 days, he's been a number one contender stuff, which which wasn't, he's been mandatory, which wasn't quite the case. And, I mean, he turned down two fights, uh, one versus Anthony Joshua. He turned on a fight versus Luis Ortiz. And while he was complaining about not getting a title fight, Deontay Wilder was fighting guys I thought were better than him uh, in Tyson Fury and, uh, and Ortiz. But... Uh, you know what it is, and I think, and 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 I'm I'm biased, Mike. The reality is that it's hard for me to sympathize with Delia White. I mean, he tested positive for PDs on two different occasions against Oscar Rivas. He changed gloves in the locker room from the ones that were proved prior. He got dropped in that fight. He was seconds away from getting knocked out by Parker. He went life and death with uh, Derek Chisora. So, in short, I don't think he's an elite heavyweight, but but. I thought he'd beat Alexander Povetkin going into Saturday night, and and I probably expect him to win in a rematch. But Mike, I don't want to see him fighting for a world title anytime soon. Not with Wilder, Fury, and Joshua in the mix. Those are the fights I want to see. Yeah, everybody agrees with you. That 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 was that was my point about the impact of that is that now we we don't have to even worry. We don't right. we didn't even have to think about it. Right. Uh, you know that that kind of thing is, you know. I, I wrote this as I understand the idea behind a, a mandatory challengers. The idea is that it forces the title holder to fight, you know, a top guy. Uh, I get that, but it just doesn't, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes the top guy is the guy you've never even heard of. Yeah. Uh, or uh, in this case, you know, it's obvious that the fight everybody wants to see is the uh, title unification between the winners of those fights. I mean, yeah. so come on, let's, uh, let's do that. I'm not sure I agree hundred percent about, I think White's a pretty good fighter. I mean, he, he beat, uh, Derek Chisora twice. He beat Joseph Parker. But I think he's obviously a pretty good, you know, if you want to call him maybe a, a second tier guy trying to yeah, prove he's a he first is. tier guy, maybe yeah. trying to prove he's a first tier guy. I think he's pretty good. But um, the point again is that he's he's out of the way. Uh, yeah, he and, is. Exactly. and now we now we could focus on the big boys and we'll see what happens with yeah. White. Maybe he should give uh, Joseph Parker a rematch because I, there you I, go. still, I can't count that as a win for for. Uh, for white, but anyway, uh, let's let's move on to some to some other news. Uh, it was announced on last Saturday's Fox PBC Fight Night card that undefeated welterweight prospect Vito Melnicki Jr. will now be trained by none other than Mr. Joe Goosen Jr. Uh, bring back the jean jackets. Uh, Goosen, one of the game's finest, he also trains welterweight uh, contender Sergey Lipinets and heavyweight contender Chris Ariola. Mike, what were your thoughts when you heard about this pairing? Listen, I've known Joe forever, uh, so I'm a little bit biased um, to begin with. Uh, but the fact is, he's one of the best trainers in the world. You know, Nicky is a gifted kid, obviously, uh, and he's had good coaching so far. He wouldn't be where he is. I just think Joe's uh, uh, the perfect guy to take him to the next level, uh, which is what I think makes the move so smart. You know, Joe is, is good with the nuts and bolts uh, of boxing, but he's particularly demanding in terms of conditioning, which is a plus. And I'm sure they're... Uh, I'm sure there isn't anyone who's better in the corner during a fight. Um, listening to his instructions, his how calm he is and how uh, to the point he is. You know, obviously he has unusual communication skills, which is why he also works as an analyst. Uh, I think it's a real good move by the Milnickis. 
What, what do you mean by when you say uh, unusual? Explain what you mean by that. Unusual. Uh, well, he's got he's got really good communication skills. Yes. Yes. Uh, which okay. is which is which is why he's why he's an analyst. But it also works in terms of, and I've seen him working with fighters. I mean, it's so easy to understand. He he's he's is is the comments he makes are so concise and to the point they're just the fighter gets it like immediately and and during a fight it, you go back and listen to him between rounds he's so calm and i think that mm. actually helps his helps his fighters and, and yes. the things he say things he says are so smart and so coaching and uh yeah so he's uh definitely got his strengths and i think that uh the veto is going to benefit from that yeah for sure you know when i first heard about it the first thing i thought just everything you just broke down, which is great communicator. And and you're talking about Mel Nicky, who's he's only 18 years old. I, I think it's a perfect uh, pairing for for such a young fighter when you have somebody so calm who has that wealth of experience uh, in your corner. And then another thing I was thinking about is the, uh, the amount of great sparring that uh, Mel Nicky is going to get that's when true. he's out there in that yeah. gym. That's it's going to be so good for him. And who knows, maybe he gets a spar, uh, Sergey Lipinets. Uh, you know, I, I absolutely love the move. Now, speaking of moves, let's move on to the PBC fight of the week. This Saturday, August 29th, Fox PBC Fight Night returns with one of the best fighters of this era. The American Dream, Eris Landy Lara, is going to be defending his WBA regular Super Welterweight title against Greg Vendetti. Action begins at 8 p.m. Eastern time on Fox and Fox at Deportes. So with that, Mike, let's have the essentials. Okay, here we go. Arislandi Lara fights out of Houston. His last fight, August 31st of last year, he knocked out Ramon Alvarez. Uh, Vendetti fights out of Wakefield, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston, uh, in case you wanted to know. His last fight, July 12th of last year, a unanimous decision over Michael Anderson. Lara is 26-3-3 and with 15 knockouts. Vendetti, 22-3-1 with 12 knockouts. Arislandi Lara is 3-1-1 one one in his last five with two knockouts. Vendetti 4-1 with one KO. Uh, almost the same knockout ratio. Lara 47%. Vendetti 46. Uh, Lara, experienced guy, 213 rounds. Vendetti 122. Lara's 37. Actually, you know what? I thought he was 38, but he's uh, in his late 30s for sure. I'll check on that. Uh, Vendetti 30. Uh, Lara turned pro in 2008, Vendetti 2013. Lara is a southpaw. Vendetti fights from an orthodox stance. Lara, here, here's a big difference. Lara's 5'9". Vendetti's only 5'6". Mm. Uh, Lara's got a 75-inch reach. I could not find a reach for Vendetti. I'm assuming it's, it's fairly short. Uh, and that's the essentials. Well, you, you're right the first time. Laura is 37 years old. I, we're all familiar with him. I mean, he's won multiple world titles. He's been one of the best fighters in the sport for a while now. And and in his advanced age, it seems like he's sort of standing his ground more in fights and, and, and fighting a lot more. But what more can you tell us about Vendetti beyond the uh, the essentials? Well, I watched, I watched some videos of him. Um, you know, as I mentioned, he's a Boston area guy. He's got some ability. Uh, he's a, a pep, perpetual motion guy. He bobs and he weaves looking for openings. I uh, actually like the way he moves his head around. It's kind of, he can be a little bit slippery, a little bit hard to hit. Uh, and he throws a lot of punches. He's a busy guy. He's really into fitness. He takes pride in that. Uh, I would say his height and maybe his lack of power could be seen as, as liabilities. Uh, his biggest win was against somebody we've heard of, y Yoshihiro Kamagai, in August 2018. That was a good win. Sadly for him in his next fight, he went to France to take on Michel Soro and suffered a pretty brutal knockout loss. Uh, he's had a couple of nice wins since that disappointment, but obviously Lara is another step up for him. Now, in your opinion, does he have a chance of winning? Not really. Um Plus, any, again, yeah, I could just say this anytime you ask me that question. Anybody's got a chance. You just right. never know. Uh, but I, I don't think he's got a very good chance at all. Um, he probably doesn't have the best style for Lara. A guy who throws a lot of punches can give a slick boxer trouble. Sure. Um, yeah, that's not the best style. But I, I just think that Lara is just too good and too experienced for him. Uh, he's, you know, listen, Lara has seen it all, both in the amateurs and right. now, now as a pro. Uh, and Vendetti doesn't really have anything special to throw at him other than his determination. And I think he is determined. Uh, but that only goes so far. I, th I think Lara handles him. Uh, but listen, there's surprise. we see surprises all the time. And remember, he is 37. So he's not... 
he's not a kid anymore. You never know when a guy like that is going to look a little bit older than he had in his previous fight. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one thing I think we've seen with Laura, as I mentioned earlier, is that he's standing his ground more. And I guess Vendetti's going to make him do that and, and fight a lot more. I don't know if that's in Vendetti's best interest because Laura's seen it all and he's done it all. I mean, he can he can fight going backwards. He can fight coming forward. Uh, he can he can stand in the trenches and, and work with you. He can he can move around the ring. So uh, I don't know where he doesn't have an advantage in this fight. Now, I think I know what your answer is going to be based on what you said already, but let's go ahead and get your pick. Who's yeah, winning would, on Saturday night? That would be throwing you a curve, wouldn't it, by picking Vendetti? <laughs> I think, I, I think I'm, I'm done picking um, underdogs, actually. <laughs> no, that's not I got, I, got, I got some tips on you for that, by the way. We'll get to that in a second. Okay. Uh, I, I think I think Laura's going to take his time, but he's going to catch catch Vendetti more and more as the fight progressive. I think Laura will probably have complete control of the fight by the third or fourth round. And I think he'll get him with something big and finish him in the middle rounds. Like you said, I think that uh, Laura probably wants to look good, set himself up for, you know, another big fight or two. So uh, that's what I see happening. KO sometime in the middle rounds. Yeah, I mean, I, I like Laura too, obviously. I think he's going to look impressive. I think Vendetti will allow him to look impressive, although it could be ugly at times. I'm going with the KO in the seventh round. Uh, honestly, the co-feature is a lot more difficult to predict for me. Uh, it's an IBF World Super Middleweight title eliminator between two veterans, Alfredo Angulo and Caleb Truax. Both these guys like to get in the trenches and duke it out. A lot of folks feel that this just might steal the show. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, Angulo is sort of a, a curiosity. Uh, a lot of people, if you don't just allow me to give a little bit of background, a lot sure. of people thought he was in decline after he lost the decision to Freddie Hernandez in 2016. Then he went away from the sport for 20 months. And then he lost the decision to Sergio Mora in 2018. Uh, I think some people even feared for his safety uh, when he agreed to fight Peter Quillen in September 2019, which is his most recent fight. Yeah, and we know what happened there. Uh, he wins a barn burner by a split yeah. decision. It was really, really surprising and really impressive, especially if you know the guy. He's like a really nice guy, and he's and he always is a really entertaining guy. Um, everybody was really happy for him. You know, he's 38 now. We'll see what he has. Uh, Truex, you know, won a super middleweight title when he upset James DeGale in 2017. He lost it in the rematch. It's 2-0 with no decision against Quillen since then. Uh, he's a good fighter. Uh, not young either. He's 36. Uh, but to get back to your question, Definitely could steal the show. Um, you know, Angulo is the kind of guy who could steal any show. He's always been that way, which is why he's always been a fan favorite. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this fight. And when you said it's hard to predict this fight, it's really hard to pick, predict this fight. Yes, seriously. And 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 I saw, obviously watched Angulo's fight versus Quillen. That was a real shocker to me. He turned back the clock a little bit, looked really, really good. <sighs> I, I'm I'm gonna let you go ahead and make your prediction first before I, I go with mine. Who do you think wins? Okay, so I'm nervous about these predictions in general, <laughs> but I'm particularly nervous about this one because I really think it's it's close to a 50-50 fight. I'm just gonna continue to go with my gut, take chances because it's kind of fun to take chances. Uh, I still think Angulo is a little past it. Um, I, I think the same thing about Quillen, which I think played a role in that fight. Uh, I'm gonna predict that Truex is gonna win uh, probably by decision. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Well, like you, I struggled with this one. I mean, it's, you know, two Cinderella stories, but I'm going to go ahead and pick Angulo to win a close decision in a fantastic affair. Now, for those who don't know, uh, Mike has lost his magic touch in our prediction league. I'm not sure one. I ever had a magic touch. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever he had, it's yeah, gone. It's, it, it's gone. And uh, it was about to happen. You know, my steady hand uh, has pulled me in the lead. I'm 14 and 4 now. Mike is 13 and 5. I'm not looking back. Uh, you know, as the great Floyd Mayweather once said, when you're in the lead, you don't have to look back. I'm leading the way. You got to worry about. I know where you are, though. I see you. I see you ahead of me. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't see you though. I'm not <laughs> looking back. Uh, so I. I know. You know. You. You mentioned it, and I. I earlier. I know this is going to make you cautious, Mike. I, I know you're going to be afraid to take risks, uh, making picks, unless you fall back some more, which you will this weekend. But you know, let me offer some sage, sound advice. Please, please do. Yeah, yeah. I, I need this. No risk, no reward, my friend. You got to aim high. But when you come at the King Mike, 
You best <laughs> the king. <laughs> you became the king. All right. I'm going to have to dethrone you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to depose you. This is going to be – I don't know if you call it a coup to get rid of the king. I think I'm going to depose you at some no, point. No, good, good luck with that is, is all I got to say. So I just wanted to share that, uh, that bit of advice with you. Obviously, we'll see what happens this weekend. I may be forced to eat my words, but I think not. I think I'll be pulling further ahead. Uh, we'll check back in next week and see where we're at. All right. It's time for this week's interview on Saturday, September 19th. He will headline a PBC on Showtime championship boxing card against rival Terrell Gaucher in a WBC world super welterweight title eliminator bout Erickson the Hammer Lubin. Erickson, first things first, how has camp been going for you uh, as you prepare for your main event September 19th on Showtime Championship Boxing? Camp's been great. Um, I've been working all year. Um, me and Kevin, we've been, been nonstop training, but, you know, um, due to the COVID, you know, we, we thought we thought we was going to get a, a earlier date sometime in the spring, but it really didn't stop nothing, you know, because we... We're, we're fine with, you know, being able to just get a date, you know, because, like, a lot of sports are, you know, messed up. But, yeah. you know, we, we got the date September 19th. We, we put in work. We've been at work. And, you know, we're ready to ready to perform. Did, did the pandemic affect the training at all? Did it interrupt it in any way or did it hinder you? Um, it, it, didn't, it didn't necessarily uh, interrupt it. But you know, it's just it, it was it was a little different this time because you know, uh, with the with the nonstop testing and and um, you know, we can't we can't have just anyone walk into the gym, or you know, everybody got to everybody got to be clean and tested, and hmm. you know, it was just a little different. Yeah. Erickson, you you seem to be in the gym all the time, anyway, uh, whether you have a fight scheduled or not. Um, do you do that just to stay in shape, or do you do you do that to specifically work on things, or sort of both? Sort of both. I, I mean, I, I'm a professional, and like, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to be, I want to be the best. And I, I talk, I talk my talk, so I got to be able to walk the walk. So that's why I'm in the gym all the time. And you know, me and Kevin, we we, we gained the chemistry, and, and, and it's definitely working. And you know. I, he, he wants me in the gym all the time, too. So, like, you know, I, I don't mind it, and I, and I love what I do. So that's why I'm always in the gym. Good deal. What's it like training in West Palm Beach? You've been out there for quite a while. It's hot. Right now, <laughs> it's, hot. it's hot as hell right now, but um, I, I like it out here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm originally from Orlando, and, you know, this is a couple hours away, so I, I'm – I like it because you know I'm not I'm not too close to to everyone I know. Yeah. But you know I I do I do got some loved ones over here as well. But you know this is like just the way and I and I like it. Now you you mentioned uh, a little while ago about talking your talk and there's been some trash talk between you and your opponent Terrell Gaucher. Do you know how that began and you know where it came from? Um, it, it began on Twitter. It began on Twitter. Um, he ain't like, he ain't like some of the things I said, you know, um, you know, I, I, th I think I'm the best in this division and I'm, I'm, I can't wait to show it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue showing it. Um, and he just didn't like, the, he ain't like, he ain't like that, I, that I said that and he came at me about it and I went right back to him and, you know, we, we, uh, especially with the fight last year, it was made, uh, between me and him. But I guess he, he, he claims he had a hand injury, so he had to pull out of the fight. And, you know, that just, that just it, it, kept, it kept it going. And then um, my handlers told me, you know, uh, if I wanted to, uh, they, they gave me that option to fight him again. And, you know, I jumped on it real quick. Me and Kevin, we jumped on that real quick. And it, this is a fight that, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of trash talking going on. But, you know, I can't wait to let my hands talk because... Hmm. Boy, I, I got some cooking. <laughs> now, do you think it sounds like you're saying that you're not entirely convinced about the hand injury? What, what do you think that was? Man, you ask me. I don't know. I, I, I seen, I seen, uh, I seen that he was having a baby around that time. So maybe, maybe he was just 
not in shape. Then his trainer was uh was taking Joshua to fight Ruiz again. Mm-hmm. So maybe his trainer couldn't, you know, be fully focused with him. But there's levels to this game. And I'm going to show it September 19th. That's for damn sure. So it, it's not necessarily real bad blood. It's just, you know, two competitors who really want to win. Right, right, gotcha. right. Erickson, Gaucher fought uh, Austin Trout to a draw last year. A lot of people thought Gaucher won. Did you watch that fight? And if so, what were your impressions? I, I thought I thought he won. I, I I thought he won too. I thought he beat uh, Austin Trout. But um, you know, um, I guess the judges weren't convinced. But mm-hmm. um, you know, he I, like I said before, he's a solid fighter. But there's levels to this game, and and I feel like I'm special in this game, and. And September 19th, man, that's all I can say is September 19th. I've been training really hard. Um, I'm ready. I'm ready to perform. I'm ready to, I'm ready for, I'm ready for one of the world titles. You know, after, you know, this is the mandatory, this is the mandatory and Charlo and Rosario, they're going at it a week later. So I'm definitely looking to, to go out there and definitely perform and just show people that I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, I'm ready to step up. How do you think he fights you, and how do you think the the bout will play out? It don't matter how he fights me. I'm gonna have an answer for everything. I'm gonna have an answer for whatever he comes at me with. Um, the bout's gonna play out. Erickson Lugan with the W. It doesn't matter how I get it. I'm gonna make sure I get it. Hmm. Now grind, you, my, my my grind different, man. My grind is different. Yeah, you sound really really focused right yeah. now, which is which is yeah. great. I mean, you know. You mentioned this is a WBC World Title Eliminator. That uh, belt is currently held by Jamel Charlo, who's going to be fighting uh, IBF WBA champion Jason Rosario in a unification a week after you on September 26th. Who do you like in that uh, Charlo versus Rosario fight? Uh, it's it's a toss up, but you know I'm 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 actually thinking Charlo. I'm thinking mm. Charlo's going to beat him. Why is that? Uh, I feel like Charlo's. Uh, He's more of a seasoned veteran, you know. Um, he, he's more athletic in my in my opinion. Uh, if he sits if he sits in there and, and and trades shots with Rosario, I think that that that's a bad idea. But um, I think he's more athletic. He moves his feet way more. He's more uh, more bouncy on his feet, and he has some punching power. Mm. So I feel like that's gonna that's gonna play a big part. And then and then Rosario, I feel like he's never been on a stage like that. You know, um, a true champion, a true champion in my book. You know, they they get the belt, they defend the belts a few, like they defend the belts and win, and, and win, not just not just win. They don't just win the belt and then you know they consider a champion and they want all the money and all that type of stuff. You got to to get all the money and get all the all everything in, in, in this boxing game. To me, you got to you got to you got to get the belts. Defend the belts, keep winning the belts, and then go up to weight classes and and win more belts and, and stuff. Win the defense, because like a lot of it, a lot of what's been going on is like, you know, these champions they win the belt one time and then fight again and then they lose it. You know, yeah. so that that to me they're not considered like a true champion. Yeah, they won the belts, that's cool and all, but you know, when when I when I when I win a belt, I, I'm looking to have that belt until I retire. You know I me, mean? so. Mm. Like, like um, Jason Rosario to show that he's a true champion, he's gonna have to go in there and and pretty much defend that belt. And he's fighting for all the belts too. So, you know, the winner of that is gonna be considered the 154 pound undisputed champion. So, we're gonna see who that is. Now, your your coach, your trainer, Kevin Cunningham, has described you as one of the most avoided fighters in boxing. Do you believe that's true? I do. I do, because they no. see this grind. And my 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 grind, my grind. I've been I've been I've been grinding ever since I took my loss, and I've been improving ever since I took my loss. So like you know, I was I was dangerous before that. I was dangerous before I even lost. So now that now that I took that loss, and you know I, I you know I I got back, got with Kevin Cunningham, and we just we we improving and everything. You know my IQ different in this boxing ring, and. No, I'm just getting better. I'm still yeah. 24 years old. Yeah, 
is crazy when you think about that. Um, you know, it, it seems like they can't avoid you forever then, because if you win your bout, uh, you'll be in line to face the winner of Charlo Rosario. Now, you already fought Jamel back in, in 2017. We, we all know about the loss and so forth. If you guys were to square off again, what would be the difference this time? It'll be, it'll be way different. It'll be way different. I'm, I'm, I'm older. Um, I'm stronger. I'm wiser. Everything, you know, my, my game has grown 100%. So that's going to be the difference. Would you say skill-wise? Jamel, 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 to me, is a, he's a true champion because he was able to get that belt and he was able to defend it. And, and, and even though he lost to Tony Harrison, he, he went back and made, made the statement and showed that the first loss was pretty much controversial. Like, the first fight was controversial. So, like, to me, he, he a true champion, but I don't feel like he's better than me. You know, he 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 showed he showed action. He showed that you know he he beat me. So like he's considerably better than me, to the, to the fans and to everyone else. But you know, um, I I can't wait. You know, I, I was young. I was I was uh, I was wasn't as experienced. You know, I got I got the I got the fights under my belt now. Um, I'm with I'm with Kevin Cunningham and and we and we working. So you know, when the when the time comes, we'll definitely be ready. So you think skill-wise, you're a different fighter as well from from that first fight. I mean, I always had the skills. I just feel like my IQ is better. I got mm. I, I I got more tricks and under my sleeve. You know, I just feel like I'm more I'm more experienced. Um, I'm with Kevin Cunningham as well, and he 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 showed he, he, he's great with southpaws. Yeah, I can't stress it enough. He's great with southpaws. You know, he yeah. he's took in. He took guys to the mountaintop, and they're all top falls. Um, and I just feel like, you know, this time will be different, whether it's Jamel or if it's even Rosario. Do Rosario you feel that... Actually, Rosario's actually up the street from me. Uh, oh, he's training over there, too? Yeah, he, he lives somewhere in Florida. Uh, have somewhere have you bumped into him? Yeah, at the doctor's office. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, well, next time, next next time you might bump dip, bump into him might be in the ring, right? Right. Yeah. Do you do you feel that that the loss to Charlo made you you know any more cautious in terms of the way you fight, or do you pretty much have the same mindset you had before before that? Uh, I feel like I feel like um, I, I still got the same mindset. I was confident before, and I'm 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 even more confident now. Good deal. Uh, the 154-pound division is pretty hot right now. We saw Sebastian Fandora stop Nathaniel Gallimore uh, last Saturday. Now, you beat Gallimore last October, and I believe you were in camp with him for this fight. Were you surprised that Fandora stopped him, especially the way he did? Um, it was impressive. It was impressive. Um, Fandora pretty much overwhelmed him. He's about six foot six. That's he, crazy. He really is a tower. Yeah. He really is a tower, but he... I mean, we sparred we sparred a few uh, a few times, and um, you know I I thought I thought he would be able to go in there and actually um, do some damage and like actually uh, let the kid know he was in a real fight. But um, Fedora did his thing, and you know big ups to him. Yeah, Fedora is only 22, but as you mentioned, you're only 24. Do you feel that gives you a, a unique advantage in the division, being that young yet having already been in the ring with the division's best? Yeah, it does. I'm a young veteran. I'm a mm -hmm. young vet. Very good. Um, are you still able to make 154 comfortably? Do you plan on moving up at some point? Easily. I'm making 154 easily. So it'll be a while easily. before. Okay. Uh, I want to I want to I want to take over the division first, and then we'll we'll talk about moving up. So there are so many fighters in that division. Everybody talks about you and Charlo again, but there are other fighters in the division that you'd love to face. Uh, I'm sure. Who else? Who else comes to mind? I want the belts. I'm going after them belts. I'm going after them belts. So that's that's what I want. But as as far as great matchups, man. The division is hot, is lit. So anybody pretty much will be, uh, you know, an exciting fight, especially with with the way I I match up with him. Like you know, Tony Harrison, 
J Rod, Jared Hurd, it doesn't matter. They're all good, good fights. Yeah, we look forward to it. Harrison, thank you for taking the time out to uh, to do this. We wish you all the best and hope to have you on again soon. Thanks for having me, guys. It's time for the week in review. Now, Saturday night, we saw the return of two-time world champion Showtime, Sean Porter on Fox PBC Fight Night. Uh, Porter took on previously unbeaten Sebastian Formel in the main event, and he did his thing. Uh, boxed more than we're accustomed to, but also brawled uh, when he had the chance, pitched a shutout on all three cards. Mike, what did you think of Porter's performance? I thought he looked terrific. Um, I, he looked sharp, you know, in spite of the long layoff. His punches were quick, accurate, hard. Uh, he boxed well. I actually liked when he bounced on his toes for a while. He gave us a little bit of a different look. Kind of gave us a little bit of everything. Um I thought he fought with ferocity, which is his thing. Um, it was intense. He had a lot of energy. Uh, and he dominated the guy, which is which is the objective. I think he probably should have found a way to stop a guy like Formella. Uh, you know, you know yeah. didn't have the power to hurt him. So, you know, he really could have gone for it. I don't think he ever would have gotten hurt. But, hey, as you mentioned, he won every round on all three cards, so it's hard to be too critical. Overall, I think it was a good performance. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Um, you know, I thought he looked good. If anything, I was surprised by Formella. Uh, he took a lot of good shots and fought right back. Tough like guy. you, I thought, you know, Sean was going to get the stop, but he was a tough guy. Uh, but, but you know, Sean couldn't put him away. Now, afterward, Sean reiterated his desire to fight the winner of the November 21st Fox pay-per-view showdown between unified champion Errol Spence Jr. and two-division champion Danny Garcia. Now, Porter beat Garcia for the WBC 147-pound title back in the fall of 2018. Then he lost that title in a very close fight with Spence last September. Naturally, he wants a crack at the winner. Mike, is that who you want to see uh, Porter fight next? Yes, I like that idea a lot. And I think he earned it with his performance against Spence in his previous fight. Um, you know, but I, I just want to see good fights. So I like Porter against any of the top guys. I, I think I think he'd also like to fight Manny Pacquiao for, for obvious reasons. Um you know, Porter versus Terrence Crawford is a compelling fight, obviously. Uh, I think he'd like another shot at Keith Thurman, another compelling yeah. fight. Uh, yeah. That would be really interesting. So there's a lot of good options for him, but I know he wants the winner of Spence Garcia, and I, I think that's the fight. I think that's the one that um, – that's the one everybody probably wants to see. Well, you know what? I – I saw earlier today your Dennis Ugas calling for a rematch with Porter. That's a pretty good one. I'm not sure that happens anytime soon. And then I'm thinking, well, what if the Spence Garcia winner wants to fight Manny Pacquiao and so forth? Then what does Porter do in that case? And I wouldn't mind seeing Porter fight the winner, uh, Spence versus Garcia. But I, you mentioned Keith Thurman. I, I really want that fight. Uh, I like, I like know, it. Uh, Thurman lost, you know, close decision to Manny Pacquiao last year. And I feel like they should fight for, he and Porter should fight for the opportunity for another world title. Um, now, obviously Thurman and Porter fought back in 2016. I, it was a classic affair. I mean, a great back and forth. And I feel a rematch between the two, both coming off defeats. It just makes too much sense to me. It's a good point. Now, now correct me if I'm wrong though. Uh, you think Porter would win a rematch versus Thurman, right? Or? 100%, yeah. Why, no, why is that? Um... Well, that goes back to what I've said in the past. Listen, I have a lot of respect for for Thurman. I think he's obvious. Obvious, I think obviously he's a really good, really good fighter, a good welterweight. Um, he looked. I'm just still not convinced he's the the, the Thurman of old, though. Um, you know, he's had to battle through some injuries, some pretty bad injuries. Um, I thought he looked so-so against Pacquiao. He kind of rallied, I think, and, and made it into a better performance than it looked like it was going to be. Uh, but I just don't think. I think Porter right now is is running on all cylinders. Uh, I think. Porter's just closer to his, you know, his best right now. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, I, I still think it's a good fight, obviously. I think these guys are comparable in terms of their ability. Uh, I just think that Porter's maybe in a little bit better place. But who knows? Maybe Thurman this time off now has given Thurman time to really recover. Uh, maybe shed maybe shed some rust against Pacquiao, something along those lines. So it's a good fight. I definitely would be interested in seeing that fight. I think everybody would. Yeah, you know... I'm not sure. I mean, I think Port is a serious threat to avenge his losses, all his losses. But I have to think Keith learned a lot in that loss to, to Pacquiao. Like you said, maybe he took off some rust and, and so forth. I don't know what his status is currently health-wise. Uh, but if he can be better than he was versus Manny, I think he's still a serious, serious threat to oh, become yeah. the man um, in the division. But so much going on in the welterweight uh, weight class that who knows 
what's going to happen. Now, let's move on to the uh, the co-feature last Saturday, a 154-pound battle between unbeaten prospects Sebastian Fondura and hard-hitting veteran Nathaniel Gallimore. Uh, Fondura turned in the finest performance of his career, no doubt, stopping Gallimore in six rounds. Mike, I know you picked Gallimore to win. How surprised were you at how well Fondura performed? I knew Fondura was good. To me, that was that was obvious, but I was surprised that he took took care of him the way he took care of him. Um, I, obviously, I had my doubts about him to some degree going to the fight, which is why I picked Gallimore. Uh, I have fewer doubts now. Uh, I thought he was sensational. Um, I'll never fully embrace or maybe not fully understand the way he fights, you know, sort of toe to toe. Instead of using his height, the guys to, to remind people, the guys like Anthony Joshua's height. Uh, and, he, and he likes to bang. But, man, oh, man, it, it works for him. Uh, those yeah. whipping shots he throws are really unusual and they're really effective. I think Gallimore just got overwhelmed by, by him. Uh, and it seems like to me, I think maybe this is yet to be determined, it seems to me Fandora can also take a shot. Yeah. Uh, you know, as I texted you after the fight, I think this kid has something. Um, you know, the writer and boxing historian extraordinaire Cliff Rold, who's also yeah. a friend of mine, he tweeted. And he's quote, awesome. Yes, he, he he tweeted quote. Everyone I know who watched Fox last weekend wants to see more of Fun, Fundora. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm one of everyone. I I really want to. I'm really excited about following this kid's career now going forward. Yeah, you know, I picked him to win, but I thought it would be much much more yeah, competitive. Of course. And, yeah. and I I was concerned he'd get KO'd. I mean, the guy's a freak of nature. He's six six, 154 pounds. He looks like a strong win. Uh, we we'll blow him over, <laughs> yeah. and and Gallimore landed some some clean hard shots. I I thought Fedor was hurt maybe in the second round or something like that, but he never stopped coming and he just overwhelmed uh, Gallimore. I, I was seriously impressed. However, that said, I do see some flaws. You know, the way he comes forward, he could walk into a bomb sure. against one of the elite. Um, so I think there's some work that needs to be done. But Mike, how far is he from a world title or fighting one of the elite in your opinion? It's a good question. I had to give this a lot of thought. You know, he's had only 16 fights. Uh, he's only had four 10-round fights. He's only 22 years old. So if I were advising him, uh, I would say there's no rush. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing him stay away from contenders, like even yeah. fringe contenders for the time being as he continues to develop. That said, after what I saw on Saturday, I think he could probably handle some fringe contenders right now. Uh, I think he's only a few fights away from fighting a top 10 guy. I think he's that... He's that advanced. Yeah, I, I, I think he's a couple fights away. I wouldn't rush him at all. There's there's a lot there that, that can still be cultivated and, and developed, and I look forward uh, to seeing that. Now, a couple other fighters did their thing as well. Big shout-out to Joey Spencer, who I thought looked great in his yeah. KO win, and, uh, and also Justin Deloach. Uh, we had Deloach on the podcast a few weeks ago. I know he talked about moving down from 154 to 147, and what do you know? Uh, he scores the first-round KO over uh, Levon Navarro, who's undefeated, and uh, Herman Caicedo stable, a good fighter, a fight a lot of folks thought would be competitive. So uh, salute to Deloach, a welcome addition in the stacked 147-pound weight class. All right, it's time for Mike and I to go toe-to-toe. And this week's debate is surrounding the news that came out of the recent WBC convention. The sanctioning body is exploring the possibility of creating an 18th weight class. Uh, this would be between cruiserweight and heavyweight, and, or what we know as the heavyweight division today. So between 200 and 225 pounds is what was discussed. Obviously, the response to this was mixed. Mike, what's your take? Yeah, I don't think we have enough weight classes. I think we should add like <laughs> like five or six or seven more weight classes. There aren't right. 17 isn't enough. Um, I, I don't like the idea at all. Um, you know, even though I understand the reasoning behind it, there's there's some logic to this. I I just don't like it. Um, you know, first, and I and I wrote I wrote this uh, unboxing junkie, so I'm sort of regurgitating that. But first, um, if I had my way, I'd, I'd go back to the eight eight weight classes uh, in, in in do away with all the sanctioning bodies. I don't want to be too too cruel there because they they serve their functions. But I want to see eight champions again. I know that I'm dreaming. I'm you know you can't go you can't go back. Uh, but I, I want, in other words, my point is this, is that I want the, the titles, the championships to actually mean more than they do right now. So that's my goal. And I think by adding another weight class, then you're, you're not moving in that direction. Um, you know, second, adding a, a junior heavyweight or is, or is it a super cruiserweight division? Uh, in effect, it would create a super heavyweight division. So, you know, above 225. Uh, amateur boxing has a heavyweight and a super heavyweight division. I think in, a, in the pros, that would sort of just... 
you're kind of like cutting the heavyweight division in half, which I think d- diminishes it. Um, you're sort of losing the tradition of what it is to be to be a heavyweight, and God, God forbid that that happens. You know, being the heavyweight champion is is the most special thing in boxing. I don't think you want to mess with that. And then third, maybe this is as important as anything. Didn't Pavetkin just demonstrate that a smaller heavyweight can compete with oversized opponents? And I thought of Deontay Wilder. Right. He's tall, but he's really lean. You know, he only weighs he was you know he's he's weighed as little as two twelve, two fifteen. Right. He's not that tall. Fonduras only in right. Like Fonduras, I guess. Right. But yeah, you're and he's there. he's done this through his whole career. And right. what about guys like Evander Holyfield and even guys like you know David Hay? Uh, you know, one title. They were really small. Uh, yeah. Heavyweights won titles. Now he you know he didn't want to fight a guy like. Josh or Klitschko because they would. Oh, he did fight Klitschko. Uh, and we saw and we saw what happened. There. So, yeah. so there there are issues with smaller heavyweights fighting the super big guys. But listen, there's some logic to creating a division. Um, they're trying to to cater to guys who sort of fall in between. I just don't think it's necessary. I think there's just too many negatives. Well, uh, you you outline a bunch of negatives and and a lot of them I you know I agree with you, um, but like George Foreman said, he said anybody over you know 200 pounds can hit. You know, bottom line. So right. uh, if he had his way, obviously, there wouldn't be uh, a need for an extra rate class. But are there any benefits to creating this? I mean, you know, guys can become two time champions if that means anything. And it does seem like the heavyweights are getting better, bigger. Do you understand that part of the debate? Or do the are there any positives or do the negatives overwhelm completely overwhelm the positives, in your opinion? Well, yes, I think they do overwhelm the positives, but they're yes. To reiterate uh, what I was alluding to, uh, you know, I hate to defend this because I just don't like the idea. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there is there is a group of guys that sort of fall in between um, cruiserweight, the cruiserweight division and the heavyweight division, who are kind of too big to be a cruiserweight and too small to fight guys like Fury and and Joshua, I suppose. I mean, but again, Pavek can just prove that they can if you're good enough. You know that kind of thing, but yeah, you're you're catering. It's it's like the same reason that they created all the junior super divisions because you're catering to guys who fall in between and giving them a place to fight where they're comfortable. But I don't know where does this end? It's just it's just, and I don't want to mess with the heavyweight division. It's just too uh, it's too special. I just don't I just don't want to mess with it. So yeah, I get it, but no, don't do it. <laughs> I think we're in agreement there. But I I want to pose this to you. Uh, just something that. Uh that I, I was wondering as I, I listened to what you were saying, obviously the amount of weight classes is staggering, but I got a matrix like uh, question for you, red pill or blue pill. If you could bring back eight weight divisions or one champion per division, which would you choose? So can you, this, the second part is, I mean, maintain the 17 divisions, but have one champion, one champion per. Yeah. Uh, well, it's sort of the same thing in a way. We would just have one champion in eight divisions as opposed to one champion in 17 divisions. So in, in my... Oh, no. I'm asking if, if, let's say, it was still the same three, four belts, but you went down eight weight divisions, right? Or if it was one champion per division. Oh, I would go with, I would go with the latter. I, I would, okay. Yeah, my goal, my goal, I don't know if a goal is even realistic because I don't think it's going to happen, but my dream would be one champion in each division. And again, I understand why there are divisions in between divisions, if you will. Uh, yeah, I think even the way it's set up now with 17 divisions, it's just every, when that comes out of my mouth, I still just can't believe they're set up. <laughs> uh, but having one champion in each one, I think would be, would be special to have three or four or five champions and eat with an eight division set up. That would be, it'd be, it, it would be bad. It would be better than what we have right now in 17 divisions, but that wouldn't be good either. No. So is there getting back to to the to the weight division for a second? Is there a happy medium um, at all in this? Let's say we we add that and cut something else down. Do you think there's a compromise to be had at all with regard to the weight classes? Yeah, I gave this. Well, I, specifically about the I'll, I'll give you two responses specifically about this new division that they want to start. I thought maybe they add a little bit of weight to the cruiserweight division again which they've already done they went from 190 to 200 maybe yeah. maybe they go up to 205 or i don't know something of something along those lines to sort of open it up a little bit more for people um i don't know what the compromise is i think i think the way that the 17 divisions are set up is probably pretty good if you want to go that direction uh i think it takes care of everybody but again I, i'm just not sure it's it's necessary for example to have 140 pound weight class between 135 and 147. I mean, boxing existed for 100 years without it, and it was just fine. Um, 
It's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, I get it. Um, it gives it it gives a, a place for the in between guys to fight, but I'm just not sure it's necessary. And for the overall health of the sport, I think it uh, would make boxing more excited if we had recognizable champions. Yes, yeah, certainly. And I don't know what it's going to take if there's if if there's enough pushback, maybe the WBC doesn't go ahead with that. I mean, will the other sanctioning bodies follow suit? Yeah, um, well, and, that's, and, that's confusing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, there's so many different ways this could go. But my my I, I'm with you. I'm completely against it. And my hope is that there's there's significant pushback to where they, they sort of shelved that idea. I think it's been bandied about before. Right. I mean, like, I feel like oh, yeah. I've heard no, no, it, it, multiple times. I think I don't know yeah. why they keep bringing this, you know, thing back. Guys up. are growing because guys are growing. They they uh, are, but are they getting better? I mean, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. And and I, I'm not saying that there aren't positives that could be taken. It'd be awesome to see a two time, three time champion. There's such a leap from light heavyweight to to yeah. heavyweight. And it's it's so sure. difficult to see that. But but it I don't know if diluting it would, makes makes for a better product. So I I think we're in agreement there. All right, now before we go, I want to remind you guys of the PBC Mask Giveaway Contest. Every week we announce a new trivia question here on the podcast and the PBC Instagram page. Each Friday, we'll pick five winners who correctly answer the trivia question. Those winners will receive a pair of PBC masks. Now, in order to enter the giveaway, you must submit your answer in the comments of the giveaway post on the PBC Instagram page. There will be a link in our show notes. And you must follow PBC on Instagram and subscribe to the PBC podcast. So with that, here's this week's trivia question. Erislandi Lara's moniker wasn't always the American dream. What was his original nickname? Now, props to you if you can get this one, because it is not easy at all. Uh, looking forward to see what the responses are. I'm sure some of them would be fairly funny. Now, as a reminder, guys, Fox PBC Fight Night returns this Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. The aforementioned Eris Lundy Lauer defending his 154-pound title versus Greg Vendetti. Plus, in the co-feature, Alfredo Angulo and Caleb Truax throw down in a 168-pound title eliminator. You'll definitely not want to miss that. And so with all of that, that concludes this week's show. We want to thank Erickson Lubin for joining us. It was great chatting with him. And we want to thank you guys, as always, for tuning in. Now, you can find the PBC Podcast on all podcast platforms, including YouTube, as well as the PBC website. And we'll be right here again next week for more Boxing Talk on the PBC podcast.